we'll give you the microphone at the end of the session if you have a question, um, if you've raised your hand. Okay, um, so hopefully everybody is ready to go. Um, and I know our speakers are, so I'll just introduce the speakers. I've turned it on. So our speakers today, there are three. Uh, the first speaker is Yvonne Simpson. Uh, Yvonne is the immediate past president of the Suroptimist International Federation of the Southwest Pacific and Project Liaison Coordinator. She's a member on the Committee of the Birthing in the Pacific Project. In her personal life, she works for Westland High School um, in New Zealand, Director of International Programs and Career Advisor. Our second speaker is Judy um, Malap, and Judy is from Papua New Guinea, New Guinea and is a member of the Thoroptimus International of the Southwest Pacific. Um, her role in the organisation is the National Representative of Papua New Guinea, a member of the RANU Club, and she's also on the Committee of the Birthing in the Pacific Project. In her personal life, she works for Ramu Sugar in the supply and logistics as a supply and logistics manager. And our third speaker is May Lamont, and May is the Suroptimus International Federation of the Southwest Pacific Project Manager. And in her personal life, her background is in education, specifically that of teaching um, the teaching of English as a second language. So welcome, ladies, to the Virtual International Day of Midwife, and we really look forward to your session. So Yvonne, I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Gillian, um, and welcome everybody to our presentation on our Suroptimus International of the South West Pacific Project, Birthing in the Pacific. Uh, this is based in Papua New Guinea to address the issue of maternal mortality. Um, the Federation Project is um, started with support from our Federation Suroptimus, and we have clubs uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Mongolia, Hong Kong, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Fiji, Samoa and the Solomons, plus Papua New Guinea. Um, so Optimus International is an international organisation uh, of 90,000 business and professional women in 127 countries. We have general consultative status with the United Nations at NCOSOC. Our mission is to transform the lives of women and girls and our focus is on education and our theme is for optimists educate to lead. Now sorrow means sister and optimist means the best and so together they combine to mean women working for the best of women and we aim to educate, empower and enable women and girls to reach their potential. So having a safe delivery as a mother is one of those objectives. Uh, Our presenters today, as have been introduced, uh, Judy Nuriat will come on next, and she is from Ramu, and Judy has been a fantastic uh, support person on the ground in Papua New Guinea. She's an amazing Suroptimist. Uh, I am from New Zealand, uh, and as uh, you introduced me, I am the project liaison. And May, being from Brisbane, she is the project manager. Now, we chose um, Papua New Guinea as a focus because we have three clubs there, Lay, Ramu and Port Moresby, and they are passionate women about maternal care and can provide the work on the ground. The maternal mortality rate in Papua New Guinea is the highest in our federation. In Papua New Guinea, 100,000 live births equates to 733 women, mothers who die as a result of birth-related factors, and most of these are preventable. It started as a proposal from a Melbourne club the Optimist International Business on Collins and was developed further by our then project manager, Janet Aspen from Townsville. She's seen in these photographs. And Janet was passionate about is passionate about midwifery and has done a lot of work to get our project to the stage it is. Uh, the appeal uh, attracted such attention that our international president made it her international president's appeal and so this uh, project went from being supported by our 13 countries to the 127 of the international organisation. So we are well supported by our sisters around the world. Our goal is to make a difference for Papua New Guinea mothers and contribute to the United Nations Millennium Development Goal number 5 to decrease maternal mortality. So I'll now hand on to um, Judy Muliat and she will to explain a little bit further. But the women in this project are very active and passionate 
make a difference and we would like to take this opportunity to thank Janet Askin for her work. Uh, hello Judy, this is Judy here. Hello Judy, um, can you just move the microphone just slightly a little further down from your mouth? It was just a little bit blurry with you gone. Uh, is, is it okay now? Yes, can I just have a show of hands? Is that better for everyone? Can you just say, say virtual international day the midwife for me Judy? Yeah, it's under my chin, so is it okay? Yeah, it's still a little bit blurry from my end. Just try and drop it a little bit further. Hello, is it okay now? Yes, that's a little bit better. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Yep, you want to go ahead? Thanks, Judy. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Julie, for this opportunity. Um, um, the project that uh, the beep, um the Southwest Pacific South Tunis International started this project. Um, the project is located in uh, two areas in, the, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, one is in Ramu and the other one is in Leyi. Um, the project uh, means a lot to us Papua New Guinean women. And um, there's a lot of challenges that Papua New Guinea, Papua New Guinea women face. And one challenge would be the, the geographical location of uh, the areas within Papua New Guinea. As you know, we have 850 languages in Papua New Guinea. And the, uh, the isolation of the remote areas makes it very difficult for women, especially women, uh, pregnant mothers, to travel from the uh, isolated you know, villages down to the, uh, to the nearest uh, aid posts or health centers. And um, in Papua New Guinea, we have limited number of health centers um, operating within the rural areas. And um, quite a lot of these health centers do not operate, do not have the, uh, the delivery facilities or birthing facilities so mothers are able to deliver. So a lot of them will deliver in the, in the villages. And again, um, when they deliver in the villages, there are other women who help them to, to deliver and, and that makes it, make, makes it so possible for them to, to deliver. The other challenges that mothers face are not enough money to pay for, you know, to pay for a book to, to go for antenatal visits to the, to the clinic or health center. And a lot of times these mothers, um, just to get money to pay for that, they have to go to the, you know, nearby a market to sell their crops and they need to walk all the way from where they are. They need to cross rivers, even uh, over mountains and then to the nearest market. And uh, to sell the crops, it doesn't take a day to, to sell all the crops and it takes about a week to sell the crops. So, you know, these are the things, whether they get enough money to pay for the um, international visit or even, or they, you know, they, they pay for their deliveries, because when they deliver at the health center, it will cost them about 15 to 20 kina, which is equivalent to 3 to 4 dollars. So, it, you know, th these are the very, uh, um, um, very important um, and points that I've mentioned. These are the challenges that this woman face. And uh, I will tell you a story of a mother, uh, of how she traveled from a rural area called Tauta Village, and that is in Medang. And now she, she managed to get down to the health center. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it. And it took her two days to, to travel uh, from where she was. And she delivered on the way. Unfortunately, the baby, she delivered the baby, but the baby died. And, and she was hanging. Uh, they couldn't cut the umbilical cord because there wasn't any aid post orderly or someone who can assist to, 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 you know, to help her. And so she was taken by a husband and uncle down until they reached the road. And um, she also passed away. And they didn't know that she passed away. She was in the um, ambulance. The ambulance 
fortunately had made it to the to the nearby road and and, and took her to the health center and, and she lost her life. So that was you know, that was another uh, very very sad story that uh, you know she had she had gone through. So um, I mean the family was will say they can't do anything. They cannot complain to the to the health center about what has happened to the to the woman because you know you know every everything happens that way and and even it's not only them it's the other other people that bring you know they come to the health center especially mothers when they die they cannot even you know complain or they cannot say anything they just accept the fact that you know they lost their loved one and um, why this training was important and we targeted the village birth attendant because we saw that the village birth attendant were where the uh, majority of them, you know, helping to deliver this woman back in the village. So that's why the project was targeted at that. So um, the village that attended, known as the uh, the local uh, or the traditional, um, you know, meet, traditional uh, birth attendants, so they, at, they attend to women at, uh, back in the village. And um, they, you know, we, we got this training up so that they, they are, they are, you know, they are skilled, and um, and they are taught to use the uh, the modern and clean uh, tools and equipment. Um, in the previous times, they they normally use the bamboos to cut the umbilical cord, and and also they they use the uh, the rope of the uh, the bush or the tree uh, just to uh, to tie the uh, umbilical cord, and and uh, with this training. Uh, we trained about 39 village bed attendants, and they've, they've attended the training. And a lot of them, um, most of them were illiterate, so we also ran a adult literacy training for them, and that was in uh, talk pidgin, um, uh, because you know a lot of them they don't speak English, they haven't been to school, so that training was was very fortunate to this woman. And as soon as they entered the, the uh, they they attended the training, you know, it, it gave them a lot of confidence now that they can help a mother to deliver uh, using the modern te technology and you know in a better and in a clean you know clean way using the like um, you know using whatever was given to them. So one of the VDs who told the story was that. She never knew that the job that she was doing back at home was just something, you know, like a woman going to the garden. And she never felt so important. But after when she attended the training, she felt so important. She felt that the role that she was doing back at home was, was very important, that she needs to be acknowledged, she needs to be recognized by the, by the community. And, you know, going back to the community, you know, you cannot, you know, be made a very important person in the in the in the community it's, it's always the men that men are not are men are known to be uh, important in the community but but, but this uh, training has also taught them that when they go back to the community they need to also educate or they need to talk to the, the community leaders especially the men that, that that job that they're doing is very important and a lot of these VBAs also face challenges that you know they when they go and you know, deliver a woman in another village. They need to walk in the night. So, uh, this project, the upskilling program, has also they've been given a set of you know, equipment to use, a torch that they can use while they attend to a delivery in another village, and that has really helped them. And and not forgetting, they they also been taught that they need to report back to the health center of how many babies that they have delivered. So far, um, about 39 VBAs been trained. We had about 150 deliveries, all all done um, without any complications. Half of them were delivered at the, the village, and half of them were referred to the health center due to complications. But you know, it, it shows that at least even even now there wasn't any statistics kept in the past, but. We are trying to maintain that this project is a, is a sustainable project, and we, we want to leave it with the government to take that on board, 
even though this project is going to go away, but still for us as Papua New Guineans, we're still going to continue this project because it means a lot to us. And we, you know, we, we want the government to, to be very actively involved and to know where we're coming at and, and, and to whatever plans that we want to put in there, you know, they, they need to take on board and, and make it a sustainable project. The, the mobilization um, uh, during that during our um, reporting of the VDAs, uh, we 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 did a mobilization program and and upon the uh, national policy of the volunteer uh, VDA and v, VHV of the um, health department of Papua New Guinea, we had to follow a policy on the um, reporting of VDAs, and so we had to. Uh, go to the uh, villages in the community and they were the ones to choose which women were suitable to, to handle the job. It's not like we're going and no, or they, no, uh, you know, we're just going and choosing ladies in the village. No. It is uh, through the uh, community that they nominate the women who have been doing work, you know, within the same area, uh, within the, um, you know, birthing um, subject for almost they about 10 to 15 years, and a lot of these women who came to attend the training, they were you know, working, delivering mothers in the village for from 10 to 15 years. We had a, you know quite a number of women in that sense, but we had a few of them who were um, uh, wanted to because they, they feel that they wanted to give back to the community and help the community. Uh, so far, we like I said, we had 39 um, village bed attendants graduates, and and we covered about. Um, about 20, we covered about 23 areas, villages within the, uh, the district of the Usino district and the um, Danhaurawa district and also we went far as Bogia in the Medang province so we've, we've done a lot. We also came in contact with the World Vision which we are, we are partnering with the World Vision. Um, like you can see as I've gone back as I've mentioned about women dying, uh, you see a lot of women dying. Uh, they they reach the health center, and, and unfortunately, because there's no doctors there, qualified doctors, so there's no uh, assistance there, and also because they cannot get to the uh, the hospital, so unfortunately they die. And even now I'm talking, their mothers and babies dying. Uh, Julie, I'll pass it to um, me. Thanks, Mari. You want to go ahead? I am. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I am right to go ahead. Can you just drop your microphone slightly? It is, is a little bit blurry. <gasps> We've readjusted it. Is that better? It's still a little bit blurry. Just, just point it away from your mouth a little bit more. It's nowhere near my mouth. It's underneath my chin. Is that better okay, now? Okay, that's a little bit better, yes. That's okay. Yep, that's great. I'm sorry for the gap. I'm readjusting the headphones. They seem to be slipping. Um, I'm Nay Lamont and I'm the project manager of the Birthing in the Pacific project now. I was the assistant uh, project manager with Janet before. 
and accompanied her on many of her journeys, so the transition has been fairly smooth to um, my um, management. Um, as you can see on your screen, uh, the project developed out of the uh, UN Millennium Development Goals, specifically looking at uh, the improvement of maternal health. Where Papua New Guinea is concerned, um, you've already heard about the maternal mortality rate. It is very high. It's one of the worst in the Asia-Pacific region. The Asia-Pacific region, other statistics are um, better, um, but Papua New Guinea has been a nation now for 30 years. It has many difficulties uh, that would compound being able to address this issue. <coughs> but they are very aware that they will need to by 2015. Um, as you can see, uh, the implications for girls um, is uh, very uh, difficult. With a population of 7 million, 50% um, of whom are under 15 years of age, a fertility rate of 5.6 children, which is quite high, health expenditure, which is uh, quite low, only 0.6% of the GDP, whereas a comparison in other um, areas, Samoa is 4.9 and Fiji is 4.1, Australia is 8.8%, you can see that it's very low by comparison. <laughs> the um, terrain itself that um, Janet was, uh, that uh, Judy was talking about, and you can see more uh, slides here, is not the only difficulty where this project is concerned. Where the women are, are um, presenting in pregnancy, the health of the women generally uh, is a great concern. Um, Many of the women are malnourished, um, suffering from TB or hepatitis, uh, anemia and heart, degree, uh, heart disease are huge problems. Um, many of the pregnancies are too many. Um, many pregnancies are really too close. And um, they generally poor access to family planning uh, services. Uh, there's um, also uh, a campaign to um, really promote this and uh, a lot of effort being put into um, not only the improvement of the services but the acceptance of family planning in itself. And of course many of these women live it in extreme poverty. What I would like to say about the previous um, statistics is this particular project of course is covering none of that. Um, the project is specifically looking at specific upskilling in various areas uh, where uh, the birth attendants are. And that word we're using generally to cover everybody from midwives, community health workers, um, down to um, the village birth attendant that uh, Judy is talking about. Um, where the lay province is concerned, uh, they, um, that's where um, the Morabi, <laughs> SI Lay is in the Morabi province and where that province is concerned, uh, we could not start by looking at their statistics to build on the project. So that is why where the Lay project is concerned, their concentration has been on uh, two uh, huge mobilisation trips. Um, into very remote areas under very uh, big difficulties uh, in just the Huon district. They are building partnerships as they go along. This is the um, type of um, terrain that uh, Judy has alluded to and this is uh, the, the focus for the project in Lay. And as you can see with terrain like this, um, although the focus of all the programs, specifically the VBA program, is ensuring that it, in, in all possibilities the first stage is to uh, accompany these women to the health centres. Um, the health centres are either not existent or the, the terrain is too difficult. We have to remember that 80% of the population 
uh, live in the rural uh, areas, and many of them living in very remote areas. So the constraints there are big, not only with transport, though, and access. These women have family roles. There are the cultural constraints of going to a health centre for a birth. And of course, as Judy has told you, there is a cost. As you can see, this young mother looks as though maybe this is her first baby, and she actually looks very young. Many of the girls uh, are married at 13. So this particular mother may well have a number of children that she has left at home. Um, and uh, those uh, children uh, will be um, maybe uh, in uh, education more often than not, not because uh, the, either the school is non-existent or once again it's in a remote area that they must walk to. Um, where the uh, babies uh, birthing are concerned, there is a great difficulty with the gathering of statistics because there's a lack of registration and also where the maternal mortality figures are concerned, they really are quite rubbery. Um, they are really a best guess and um, because uh, many of the deaths are not recorded uh, in the first place. Um, that down in the market area, these are the women that we are talking about that we need uh, to, within our project, um, give assistance to the people who are working with them. Um, through Optimist Internationally, as you have heard, are um, raising money for these projects. The, um, we also have a component uh, of the project, uh, which is um, the major component. And that this is uh, working on two national health departments, that's PNG National Health Department um, initiatives. Um, they've set up a reproductive health training unit, and there are two programs within that that we are, uh, are beginning to uh, assist with funding. Um, the, the programs themselves are being run by um, the um, people who are experts in the field. Our uh, role in that is really to assist uh, in a very major component of the program, actually, and that's the provision of the teaching models and the teaching aids that are needed to ensure that that project works. So as part of the uh, program, uh, by the way, the, the uh, a community health worker program is a pilot program in itself. And uh, it is quite unique there. It's uh, hospital based at Mount Hagen. It's also a program that has um, an eight month course. It's residential and it's very much uh, based on uh, the practical work um, to give the community health workers who attend it um, experience of good practice um, as well as uh, the lecture side of it which is um, a, a, a lesser component but occurs every day. Um, so they get to lo know good birthing uh, practices and um, the background in uh, a, a good training hospital. Uh, the, um, the, the, the models that we've just looked at are models that will be distributed to uh, the uh, training hospitals where those courses are being facilitated. The resourcing of uh, the midwives and the general hospital, um, this is one resource that we have found everybody has asked for, and we are uh, using this wherever training models have been given. And uh, the um, work films that you can see there, um, they're also asking for many other things in terms of um, things as, as, as small as gloves for working, even in the major hospitals. There is a midwife society in Papua New Guinea, and we're helping to work that uh, to build that midwife society. The um, the society itself uh, is beginning to grow, and um, that's uh, of uh, great joy to us. Uh, where the birthing attendants are concerned who uh, are in the villages, 
to ensure that uh, because their their uh, training is um, really based on uh, good good health um, and good practice, if they had to attend a birth, and this is what uh, will be contained in a kit that um, they will receive. There are other resources, as you can see on the right, that they will be uh, given to, quite simple resources that they will take back to assist them in their work. There is a huge emphasis on community support. And so in the community centres that we are using, um, we are also looking at what is needed in the community centres for um, the uh, training um, to uh, become uh, much more professional. So in the Gusat Health Centre, which is in Ramu, uh, we have provided um, beds and also uh, provided um, other equipment that uh, is they know necessary, they, they know that they are, are able to use, they're trained to use, but that equipment doesn't exist. And that's a stress actually, not only for people who are at that uh, midwife level, it's a constraint for many of the uh, specialised people uh, who are working in the PNG health department. So our aim, our aim is safe and healthy mothers and babies. But more than that, we really are aiming that this project, which has been today extended to 2016, as far as um, a project for the, our federation is concerned and the countries within it, this project um, is uh, a one that uh, we are hoping to build sustainability. Uh, the, the, um, the need is huge and will take many years to accomplish. So as Judy has already said, we will pass this on to uh, hopefully uh, the provincial government and the national government to take up. Uh, as uh, something that they can then perhaps sustainably support. We, at the moment, are doing this work uh, with our own budgets, mainly because the health department itself does not, on the provincial health de uh, department, do not have the money to uh, facilitate this work themselves. They know full well what they would like to do. We're working within their programs, we're trying to assist in achieving their goals, so this doesn't stand aside. This is part and part parcel of what uh, PNG itself is aiming to do. And uh, within that, though, our hope is that in the end it will be a sustainable project. Can't hear. Oh, Julie, I'm sorry I finished. The time is up. Okay, thank you very much for that, May. That was an excellent presentation. That was very clear. Your voice was lovely. Um, so thank you very much for that. Now, we certainly have lots of questions coming through here. So I'll maybe um, start with... Um, now her name on the thing is, is Palm Down Under, so I'll just check. Palm, would you like to ask the question? You were talking about, um, you know, whether the high mortality rates were evident, you know, in pre, you know, like a, quite a while ago as opposed to now. Um, so would you like to ask that question? Thank you very much, Hannah. <laughs> I'll enable your microphone. I'm sorry, I thought you were answering the question for that person. Um, as I've said, the, the statistics are very difficult and in fact uh, many people who are working uh, academics in this area are suggesting that we don't use figures at all. But of course we know how important they are. Um, statistically, uh, no, the, the figures are becoming more and more apparent. Uh, knowledge of the need and knowledge of what's been happening, yes, it's been known for many years, especially by the professionals. 
and a great deal of um, work has gone on behind the scenes in order to get uh, the state government itself and the focus um, and uh, the community, uh, the big communities out there um, who are helping to fund this, like AusAid, um, are getting them more focused on this particular area. Excellent. Thanks, May. Uh, there was also some questions that came through in relation to the training mo um, mo models that were used. And um, someone made the comment that AusAid and who is supporting midwifery education. I think that was the um, Garoka midwife made that comment. So are you finding that in all of the areas? Um, you, you're talking about the AusAid funding? Oh, just talking about the models that are used. You had a couple of models which I think were a prompt trainer and a neonatally. Uh -huh. Yeah, that yeah, neonatally so dolls. And um, what was the question about those models? They are being oh, they funded been... through. They're being funded through our project. We bought sixty okay, of then. them, and they will eventually, as I say, be uh, delivered back to uh, people we had trained, who will then use them to continue in their training in uh, their training centres. That's great, excellent. Yes, uh, we, we use the same models here in, in Australia, so that's why I knew them, so that's great. Um, one of the other questions was around, um, and we heard from the previous session in India, that midwifery is taught as part of um, a nursing curriculum. There's not a separate um, curriculum for midwifery. Is that correct? Um, the, uh, the situation at the moment is very interesting in the country uh, where the midwifery course is concerned at, um, in the um, training hospitals where it still exists. There are four of them where it still exists because what has happened is the people who were um, up till um, in, in the past seven years who were attending those courses were not getting accreditation and registration. Uh, what happens now uh, is that AusAid has funded um, uh, eight uh, trainers from Australia, uh, headed up by uh, Pat Brody, whom many of your listeners may well know, um, and they are uh, looking at the training component, updating it, assisting in that and so the hope is then that from now on uh, that course will be a better course and the people uh, finishing the course will automatically receive accreditation. Okay, excellent. Alright, uh, there's a question from Shannon and she'd like to ask a question she's raised her hand so I'll just enable her microphone. Shannon, would you like to go ahead? Okay, it was I seem to have lost I'm sorry, and I can't read exactly what she's written. No, that's okay, mate. She seems to have dropped off. <coughs> Hello. Okay, Simon, I think you've got your hand, mate. Would you like to ask a question? Um, hello. 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 Yeah, I can hear you. Hello, this is Shannon. Hello. This is Shannon. I am from Australia. Yes. Uh, hello. I just want to know that in India we have a lot of traditional midwives and uh, government have started their training and now stopped. But uh, the, um, I want to know that what is the role of the traditional midwives in your country? I'm not, I'm, uh, I didn't understand all of that. The line was very bad, so I don't know what the question was. Julian, can you may say I, on the question? Yes, I may. I think it was around the role of traditional midwives in your country. So the ones that were not or have not been trained, 
um, what is their role currently now in PNG? Are they still attending um, women? Uh, yes, many of the nurses themselves um, are uh, instrumental in um, doing the birthing uh, in the hospitals. They do not have midwifery training themselves, and uh, but they become experienced in that birthing practice. There is such a lack of midwives in the country. Uh, the looking looking at retraining all of those women to get them all certificated is really too too large. I have asked for figures for how many midwives uh, midwives there are that properly certificated midwives and registered in the whole country, and the figures have varied from just a little over 300 in the whole country to 270 uh, ish within the public health system. Okay, all right, thank you for that. All right, it seems that Shannon's back, so Shannon, would you like to ask your question now? Yes, it just takes me a second to get it on, so can you hear me? Yes, I we can, can hear you, Shannon, yes. There's a delay from back and forth, so my question is, oftentimes those of us in the States are given things like this and shown these little kits and told to donate or send these kits, and what we're trying to figure out is, are these kits actually, are all of these items used per birth? Is this just something that people are doing to make them feel better on this side? Are these actual materials that you need? How are these being used in each individual birth? And would there be other things that would be better to send? Or are there different things that would be real, meeting real needs? Um, yeah, well, I'd, I'd, uh, the line once again is not good. I didn't understand all those questions. Are you talking about the slide that I put up? Uh, to do with the birthing kit that um, we're yes, getting the midwife, the work The one with the plastic the things in it? So the birthing kit? Yes, the one with the razor blade. I think it was a razor blade. Somebody asked where the solar torch was. That, right there. Well, unfortunately, You've not got the slide that I've got in front of me that just says sterile scalpel. You've got one that says razor blade, apparently. The one in front the of me says sterile scalpel. Everybody has seen the slide that you've got up here, um, May, now called Basic Birthing Kit with a plastic sheet, soap, gloves, gauze, square string scalpel and a sheet to cover the mother. Are they all the items that are used? And I think she's asking, would there be other things that you would like in these kits that would be of more use to you? Um, 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 oh, these are, um, this is only in what's called the basic birthing kit. There are other things that these uh, village birth attendants go away with. Um, the sky's the limit, not only with them, but with the community health workers who are, are uh, telling us what the situation is in their own um, uh, health centres or uh, they may be working in a clinic um, and of course there are also aid posts here. All of them, all uh, need a lot of basic equipment which they do not have. Okay, I think when you said before that, you know, thanks, Shannon. I think when you said before, you know, women have to pay three to four dollars um, per birth, and that that's all, you know, a lot of money for them, and it's hard to find. I mean, from our perspective, it just seems three dollars is so insignificant um, for what we do, and you know, it really does make you want to, you know, even if if everyone donated eighteen dollars, you know that. It's just such a small amount of money that could, you know, provide women with just such such safe, basic um, items necessary for care. The interesting thing about that is that, in fact, there was a government initiative that suggested 
um, that in, uh, which came from uh, the women's movement, the NGO movement itself there, um, that uh, there would be, uh, uh, that cost would be completely uh, wiped. What I found in going back last time is it's not the case. Um, although there might have been government legislation, the people who are delivering the health services are the provincial governments and largely, the, uh, and they have the money, and largely uh, the um, health centres and the hospitals are making their own rules. And one of the reasons why they retained having a structure for payment and I agree with you, it sounds very, very little to us, but if you're talking about an unemployed person and you're, you're talking about um, uh, a person uh, who is a sustainable farmer, that is a huge amount of money. And the aid centres uh, and the health clinics and hospitals are saying we're retaining that because in fact we are so short of uh, other equipment that we in fact are using that money for that. And so they're very, very reluctant themselves to give it up. I know that there are, um, I've heard of um, organisations here in Australia who actually um, organise days where they get a whole group of people together and I'm not sure exactly what it's called, so if anybody knows, please put it in the chat box, but where they actually have this making up of these basic birthing kits to send and I'm not sure if they're sending them to Papua New Guinea, but I know that they're quite frequent around Australia. So does anyone know what they're called? Yeah, it's called Birth Kit might... Assembly. I thought you, well, what you might be uh, calling um, the work that the Birthing Foundation uh, in Australia is doing. Um, and uh, they are uh, asking community groups to help them with assembling the birthing kits. They provide all the material. Um, I actually attended one in Brisbane that was organised by Zonta. And in that, uh, we had the CEO from the Birthing Kit Foundation there and uh, we packed, while we were there, we assembled um, the 10,000th uh, birthing kit that they had uh, sent off. Um, they have uh, the, their own way of distributing them and uh, although Zonta uh, provided that service, they were not doing any distribution. We are going to link in with the Birthing Kit Foundation uh, in order to set up within their organisation uh, the supply of birthing kits that we need. Lovely. All right, thank you very much for that, May. Um, it was a wonderful session and thank you very much to um, Yvonne and Judy and Christine being in the background for helping with the technical support. Um, so thanks very much for, for those. I'll just um, go through a couple of the um, slides at the end.